Hey everyone, Steve from Backcountry Gallery here. I've had a lot of people asking me lately about how I set my Z cameras for wildlife action. So in this video, I'm going to show you my top tips. Also, please note that this video is based on firmware 3.0 for the Z6 and 7 and 1.11 for little Z50. Now, the first and maybe most significant trick to getting a higher keeper rate with your Z camera is making sure you use the tools at your disposal in the right way at the right time. For the Z cameras, especially during more action-oriented opportunities, making the appropriate decision from a settings standpoint can have a tremendous impact on your final keeper rate, much more so than with a modern DSLR. Speaking of which, you also need to keep realistic expectations here. Although the tips and techniques in this video will help you secure more keepers with your Z camera in an action scenario, they're not going to bring it to the level of a modern Nikon DSLR. The Z cameras just aren't quite there yet as of this recording. Also, I know there are probably hundreds of general tips for action photography, but for this video, I'm keeping it limited to the things that are specific to the Z series cameras and the things that have worked best for me. Let's go ahead and jump in. Autofocus. First, let's talk autofocus. The first tip is pretty easy, and that is to set your AF mode to AFC. If you're doing action, you need the camera to continuously focus if you want to keep that action in focus. That's pretty simple. Next, let's talk about using the best AF area mode for the job. This is one of those places where making the right choice can have an incredibly positive effect on your keeper rate. With DSLRs, we had a lot of overlap. For example, I could almost use smaller dynamic modes and group AF interchangeably for most scenarios. For the Z cameras, it's far more critical that you pick the right mode for the job. For static or very slow moving targets, I use regular old single point AF. If things start moving a bit faster, or if I'm on an unstable platform like a pontoon boat or a kayak, then I'll go ahead and switch to dynamic. Now, a good way to tell when it's time to switch to dynamic from single point is when you start having a tough time keeping the single AF point consistently on target. In fact, a good way to think of dynamic AF is like assisted single point AF. With dynamic, you use the AF sensor in the middle of the AF area as your primary point, just like maybe if you were shooting single point AF. However, there are helper points all around it and the square formed by the little dots shows you the edges of that area. The way it works is you start with the primary point and focus on your target. If you happen to fall off the target and that target is still within the AF area, one of the helper points will take over until you get back on target again. However, if that helper point loses the lock, your primary AF point will focus on whatever is under it. Sometimes the wrong part of the subject, sometimes the background or the foreground. So dynamic works best when you can mostly Keep that single primary AF point on the subject, but you just need a little help from time to time. Now, when the action starts to heat up a bit more, I like to switch to one of the wide AF areas, especially that wide small area. I love that one. In fact, I use the wide small area for most of my action work with the Z cameras. The wide areas work a little like Group AF did in our DSLRs. The square is made up of multiple AF points, and the system tries to prioritize whatever is closest to the camera. Now, it doesn't work quite as well as Group AF for close focus priority, but honestly it does get the job done. The trick with these wide area modes is that they don't offer the precision of single point or dynamic AF. While they do tend to focus on whatever is closest to the camera, if that doesn't qualify as a good AF target, they may focus on something else under the AF box. This usually isn't a big deal if the box covers enough of the subject, but for smaller subjects it can become kind of a problem. In my experience, if the subject is actually smaller than the AF area, you do run the risk of the camera jumping to the background, especially with a moving subject against like a nice contrasty background. In those cases, dynamic often works better since the smaller primary AF point isn't larger than the subject itself. Still, both of the wide modes work fairly well and are definitely my first choice for tracking subjects moving at fast like bird in flight type speeds. There's also the auto AF area mode, and I'll sometimes turn to that mode for fast moving subjects on a clean and or distant background. If the background is too contrasty or too close, auto AF area can sometimes latch onto that instead. Still, for some fast moving subjects, it can work incredibly well. 
The auto AF area also includes tracking mode, but honestly I haven't been overly impressed with tracking mode for my own wildlife work, so I seldom use it. Instead, I tend to move my AF area to where I need it in the frame using a little joystick. However, I think tracking mode would work well for other types of action. In fact, if I was doing sports, I'd probably be using it a lot. The key takeaway for AF areas is that you'll need to switch them a little more than you probably did in your DSLR. If one area doesn't seem to be working for what you're shooting, don't hesitate to try another one. It can have a huge impact. By the way, I'm going to put out a video down the road that goes over the AF system in much greater detail. For this video, I'm just giving you the basics for action work. In addition, I'm also working on a new Z-Series autofocus book that will cover topics like this in far greater detail. Right now it's like around 400 pages and I'm adding new info every day. It should be really helpful for any Z-Series user, so make sure you sign up for my free email newsletter so you're the first to know when it's released. Oh, and speaking of releases, should be out sometime June of this year, 2020. Focus tracking with lock on. Let's head to the custom setting menu and check out that focus tracking with lock on option. This option is a way for you to tell the camera what to do if you're tracking a subject and the AF area detects a drastic change in distance. Note that this setting doesn't affect tracking performance if the camera has an active lock. It only kicks in if that lock is disrupted due to a significant change in distance. So, for example, maybe you're tracking a bird and a tree comes between the two of you. How long should the camera wait before giving up on the bird and focusing on the tree? That's what this setting allows you to tell the camera. A setting of 1 tells the camera to not really wait at all. A setting of 5 tells it to wait as long as possible. It also works the other way. If you're tracking a subject and you accidentally allow the AF area to slip off that subject, this setting will determine how long the camera waits until it tries to switch to and start focusing on another subject. So, what's the best setting? Well, it depends. This really isn't a set it and forget it option. Plus, it depends on the shooter and the situation. There's really not a right or wrong answer here, so I'm going to go over the benefits for both faster and slower settings. First, the faster settings, like one or two. This tells the camera that if it detects a significant change in distance under the AF area, to wait a minimal amount of time before trying to lock on to whatever is currently under the AF area. This setting is really handy if you're switching from one target to another nearby target since you can do so without releasing the AF button. Put the AF area on the new subject and the camera will jump to it a split second later. It's also handy if you attempt to lock onto a subject and the AF area grabs the background instead. Just stay on the intended subject with autofocus engaged and in a split second or so it should, should being the operative word, latch onto the correct target. On the other hand, there are advantages to the longer setting. If you set to 4 or 5, this is telling the camera to hesitate a bit longer before jumping to a new subject. So if you are panning along with a subject and a tree or some brush comes between you, the camera won't instantly jump to that foreground. It also means if you're tracking a subject and you accidentally allow the AF point to fall off that subject, the camera won't immediately try to lock onto something else. As a little hint, if you're brand new to tracking, this can prove very handy. Personally, I've been using sort of a hybrid approach to this lately. I set it to 5, but at the same time I make it my personal responsibility to engage and disengage AF as needed. If I try to focus and the camera hits the background, I let off of the autofocus, I don't wait for it to grab on, I just let off and then I re-engage myself. If I need to switch subjects, again I let off the autofocus, I position the AF area over the new subject and then I re-engage. In this way, I sort of have the best of both worlds. If an obstacle comes between the camera and the target, the camera will wait as long as possible before jumping to something else. If I need to quickly change subjects or make a second attempt at a subject, I simply let go of the AF button for a quick second and then I re-engage. The biggest trick here is learning to let go of that AF button when you need to. It's easy, like in all of the excitement, to just sort of press and press and press and not let go. However, if you can really manage your autofocus button, this approach can actually work really well. At least it has for me so far. I can't say I'm going to use it like this all the time, but lately it's been working out well. Again though, what works for me may be a bad match for you depending on your skill level, your shooting style, and of course what you shoot. So remember to experiment. Also, if you're still not sure what to do, the default setting of 3 is kind of a nice compromise. Turn off Apply Settings to Live View. Now another way i found to improve AF performance is to shut off the Apply Settings to Live View 
custom setting. Now, I admit, I was a little bit skeptical about this at first, and I was hesitant to give up my real-time, what you see is what you get exposure feed, but after flipping back and forth in the field between the on and off setting, I have to tell you, I'm a believer. Where I really noticed the improvement seems to be with initial lock-on. It seems to help tracking a little too, but in my field test, it seemed like initial lock-on was really where I saw the most improvement by shutting this off. Of course, when you turn it off, you'll have to be careful of your exposure again because what you see in the viewfinder is just, to kind of paraphrase Nikon here, a level of brightness intended for comfortable viewing, that's what they say, and not the actual exposure. Still, it's worth turning off if you find your AF system isn't quite keeping up. Me personally, I don't have it off all the time or on all the time. I kind of use it as needed. I do like having that exposure preview, so sometimes I'll leave it on, and if I see the autofocus seems to be struggling or I know I'm in a situation where I think it's going to struggle, then I'll go ahead and turn it off. Keep firmware up to date. The next tip is easy. Keep your firmware up to date. The cameras keep getting better with each firmware update, so it's one of the easiest ways I know to get more from your Z camera. If you don't know how to update Nikon firmware, check out the video on the card above. I'll take you through the process step by step, super easy. Frame rate tips. Next, let's talk frame rate. And for action, that really comes down to one of two choices, continuous high or continuous high extended. For action where you're moving the camera side to side as you track the subject, maybe the subject's moving horizontally in front of you or maybe even diagonally, I recommend sticking with the standard continuous high rate. It's slower, but it's far easier to track. The subject is more or less where it appears to be in your viewfinder. For action coming right at the camera on ground level, like maybe someone running towards you, or action taking place while the subject stands still, like maybe a bird shaking off after it preens, the extended continuous high mode works really well for that. The reason I don't recommend the extended continuous high mode for what you might think of as a typical action scenario is because you get a slideshow view of the images as you shoot them rather than a live feed. This means that you're looking at what you just shot as opposed to what's actually happening in the viewfinder in real time. To demonstrate this difference, I shot a video of a metronome in both modes. First, check out standard continuous high. As you can see, there is a blackout between the frames, but the position of the target agrees with what you see on the back of the camera. Now let's try the same thing in continuous high extended mode. This time, it's all over the place and what you see on the back LCD panel seldom agrees with what is happening in real life. Of course, I realize you're not shooting metronomes, but I'm sure most people watching this video can kind of see how this applies. When you're in extended continuous high mode, what you see in the viewfinder isn't what you get and it's easy to lose track of the subject or focus on the wrong part of the subject. This really causes a problem when tracking a subject, say, from left to right. However, it still can work fine if the subject is more or less in the same place in the viewfinder, but doing something active, like again, a bird shaking off for instance. Also, I know some people say you can get accustomed to the slideshow effect and it can be used effectively for some action scenarios. However, I just haven't had that much luck with it for what I shoot. It could be partially because many of the action subjects that I shoot are both moving fast and at close frame filling range. I have found that the slower the subject is moving, the easier it is to use that continuous extended high mode. But again, for me, it just doesn't work out that well. Also, another quick note or two on frame rate. Your maximum frame rate is determined by a number of factors as shown here on the screen. Image type, bit depth, and using or not using silent photography mode can all affect your maximum frame rate. There's a lot of info here, so feel free to pause if you need to. Adaptive versus native lenses. Another trick, albeit an expensive one, is to use native Z-mount lenses whenever possible. When I've compared AF speeds between using an F-mount lens on a modern Nikon DSLR, something like a D850 for example, to using that same lens adapted to a Z-series camera with an FTZ adapter, I found that the adapted lens on the Z-series camera focuses at about half the speed it does on the DSLR when starting from minimum focus distance, very generally and in most cases that applies. Interestingly though, for adapted zoom lenses, they focus at about half DSLR speed at their longest focal length, but when they are at their shortest focal length, 
they are nearly as fast as when they're on a DSLR. I tried this with three different high-end zooms and they all acted the same, so go figure. In fact, here are some of the numbers for a few different lenses. As you can see, you lose speed when you adapt an F-mount lens to the Z cameras. I tried this with both the apply settings to live view custom setting turned on and off, didn't make any difference in AF speed. I also tried multiple cameras and three different copies of the FTZ adapter and the results were all very consistent. However, when I compared the native 24-70-2.8 Z-mount lens to the adapted 24-70-2.8 F-mount lens on the Z6 and 7, the native Z-series lens was actually faster. Interestingly though, it wasn't as fast as the 24-70-2.8 F-mount lens on the D850, but again, it was faster than adapting that F-mount lens to the Z camera with the FTZ adapter. Hopefully that made sense. So, using the native Z-mount lenses can help with speed. Plus, the autofocus on the native Z lens seems more confident and sure than the adapted glass. Of course, I do realize that at the time of this video, we don't yet have a full selection of lenses, especially the lenses a lot of us use as wildlife photographers. However, when those lenses are released, based on what I've found so far, it's probably not a bad idea to consider them. In the meantime, there are a couple of tricks you can use for adapted lenses to sort of work around the slower AF speeds. The first is to take advantage of the focus limit switch if your lens has one and if the subject is of course at the proper distance range. This will take out about half the focus ring travel and can really help you get back on target in the event the lens decides to go on like a focus hunting trip. Plus, I've discovered that although the adapted lenses are slower from minimum focus distance to infinity, it turns out the ones I tested are generally within like 0.1 to 0.2 seconds of DSLR speed if you're starting in the middle of the focus range and then going to infinity. In short, if you start from the middle, it's really not possible to tell the difference with the naked eye between the DSLR and the mirrorless cameras, so that could be a huge advantage. The second trick is to do your best to get the focus distance at about the same range as the subject. That way, the lens doesn't have to move the focusing ring as much than it would if you're maybe, again, starting from minimum focus distance. The closer you are to the right focus distance, the better your chances. Buffer performance. Next, let's get a little more performance out of the buffer. If you shoot action with the Z cameras, you may have run into the buffer occasionally, especially if you were using continuous high extended. However, there are a few ways to get a few more shots in that buffer. First, consider shooting 12-bit for action. The difference between 12-bit and 14-bit is nearly imperceptible in most cases for a properly exposed image. Where you may see a difference between 12 and 14-bit is if you really have to pull the really deep shadows, and I mean, you'd have to pull those deep shadows quite a bit. On the other hand, 12-bit files are smaller than their 14-bit counterparts, so they take up less room in the buffer, giving you a few more shots. Shots that, you know, might be the best of the bunch. The other trick is to employ one of the camera's crop modes if you're in a situation where you're going to need to crop anyway. This will produce a smaller file and give you more time before your buffer dries up. Plus, the Z cameras don't just like outline the crop area in the viewfinder like our DSLRs did. They zoom the viewfinder into the cropped area so it looks just like it does when you're shooting with the full sensor. So those are my main tips for getting better performance from your Z camera. Again, these tips won't turn your Z series into like a D5 or D850 type performer or anything, but they should help you get more keepers. By the way, if you happen to have a tip for getting more performance out of the Z cameras for action work that maybe I haven't mentioned here, feel free to share it in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. I was also thinking of sharing how I have all my Z series buttons and controls configured, but I think this video is probably long enough as it is. If you would like a video that talks about how I have the buttons configured though, again, let me know in the comments and I'll make that happen if enough people are interested. Also, if you enjoyed these tips, make sure you check out all the books and video workshop series I have on my site. The tips, tricks, and techniques you find in my YouTube videos are just the very tip of the iceberg. The books and video workshops have all the best stuff. Oh, and make sure you sign up for my free email newsletter so you never miss a video, an article, one of those video workshops I was talking about, or a regular workshop, or maybe most importantly, that book announcement for the Z-Series autofocus system that's coming up soon. Finally, remember to like, subscribe, and click the notify bell so you never miss a video. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great day.